giving me this chance to share your gospel. Thank you for giving me this chance to uh, speak. And I pray this morning, Lord, that you would empty this vessel of self and fill it with you. Please, Father, be with us that we would learn something new. Teach us more about you. And as we leave this place, may we be more like you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, when I was approached about speaking here uh, today, Uncle Joe was the one that actually got to me. If you guys don't know who Uncle Joe is, it's Joe Koo. I call him Uncle out of respect. And we are related by the blood of Jesus. So Uncle Joe came up to me. I was actually, it was, Sabbath, uh, it was the last Sabbath of Camp Soquel. And my friend BJ and I were, we're a little bored. We don't, uh, we're part of the praise team that, that helps out in the main auditorium. And every day we are constantly practicing. From the moment we wake up, our pianist, Jackie, uh, she, she will catch me. Jim, hey, when you get back, we practice. I was like, oh, come on, it's 5 o'clock. Let me go and work out first. So we practice all day. And we get short breaks in the middle of those practices. But even in those short breaks, it's literally just to walk downstairs, you know, grab a cookie from case lots, and then come back up. But this day on Sabbath, this is what is another reason I enjoy Sabbath, is because we had some time to go and mingle. So BJ and I had just finished eating. BJ is my other friend. He's in. And some often Hawaiians, when we get together, uh, it, it's, it's over. Anyway, we had just finished eating. The, uh, the people that have participated in SoCal, the leaders and those who are running the programs, uh, the conference had put together a catered meal for us in the back, in the green room. We had a catered Mexican lunch. Oh, man. They had enchilada. They had some horchata, agua fresca, beans and rice. If you're not getting it yet, I'm, I, I, I love Mexican food. I love Latin food. Okay, uh, I grew up around it, so... That's always my go-to meal. We had just finished eating. We ate everything, not everything, but we were full, and we decided we're going to walk around. So as we're walking around, we're passing up, and, and we see uh, Jono's uh, golf cart over there. And he says, hey, is he, is he there in his, in, in his trailer? I was like, I don't know. Let's go check. So we go over there. I have my ukulele with, him, uh, with me. We walk over, and right before we get there, Uncle Joe stops me. Hey, I said, what are you doing in October? I'm like, it's July, brother. What? What are you doing in October? I said, ah, uh, life? I, I don't know. He just kind of caught me off guard. Well, we have a space for you that we'd like, to, we'd like for you to come and speak for us. I'm like, okay. I don't really plan that. But the whole time I was trying to get away from him because I was actually trying to go over to where Jono is. But before I could get to Jono's tent or his, his trailer, Jono comes over. And the first thing before uh, Uncle Joe asked me that, he says, have you eaten yet? I was like, yeah, we're, we're good. And then when Jono comes over, the first thing he asks me is, hey, bro, have, have you eaten yet? And I'm like, do I look like I'm hungry? Why is everybody asking me <laughs> why I'm eating? And this is one of the beautiful things about Kel is that you can go up and down these roads, and people will invite you in. They don't even know who you are. They don't even have to know who you are. They will invite you to come on in and have a meal, and I think that's great. First of all, it's free. Second of all, they don't know who you are. You don't, have, you don't, you don't own anything. And they're going to constantly ask you, hey, have you eaten yet, brother? Have you eaten yet, sister? It was normal for these two to ask, have we eaten yet? And I said, no, we're fine. So Uncle Joe asked me, and he said, okay, well, I'll tell you what. And, and this was one of the things that I was glad that I have, the service that I have for the phone. Sprint is ridiculously bad up there. I knew the kind of person that he is. He's going to ask me for my phone number. I was like, it's not going to work. He's not going to catch me. Hey, Vasa, let me just get your phone number real quick so that I can call you. All right, go ahead. So I gave him my number. I don't know been the Holy Spirit that talked to him because I went down into town where reception comes back and I get a text from him. Hey, remember, uh, I need you to come in and speak. I was like, are you kidding me? This guy is relentless. <laughs> so finally, I said, OK, I, I, I have uh, next week, which I had originally planned to speak uh, for uh, for this church next week. He's like, sorry, there's something going on. I was like, what about the week before? Sorry, there's something going on. I really did not want to speak today. And I'll tell you the reason why later on. But he nailed me, and he said, okay, we'll have you in on October 14th. And I was like, all right. So today, because as we're doing all of that, when we're driving through, we finally get a hold of, you know, we finally get to Jono's golf cart. And every time we're passing by somebody, hey, guys, how you doing? Hey, have you guys eaten yet? 
yeah, we're fine, we're fine. We're going, I'm playing my ukulele, driving, he's saying hi to people, I'm saying hi to people. We pass by, hey, have you guys eaten yet? And I'm really thinking, like, why is everybody asking me, have we eaten yet? And what's funny is, when Uncle Joe asked me to speak, the first thing that came to mind was food. Not so much food, but the fact that I was hungry. And mind you, I had just eaten. So why was this stuff going on in my mind? So we come, we're passing up the other tents. We're coming closer to uh, a Shady Grove where people are coming in from there. We pass up the Spanish tent. And just for the fun of it, we head up the hill. Now, most golf carts can't make it. Janos can. So we head up still playing my ukulele, singing, watching people. They're like, oh, it must be nice to have it. It's like, yes, it is nice to have it. And we're still going up. We get to the top of the hill, and I'm still thinking, man, I'm hungry. But I just ate. We get to the top. It's like a whole nother campground up there. People are camping out. People are have, they have food. And once again, I'm here like, man, I could really go for something to eat right now. Now, if you know me, I, don't, I, I know it doesn't look like it, but I don't eat a lot. I tend to snack a lot, but I don't eat a lot. If I sit down at a meal with you, I'll probably end up eating less than you do. And you'll wonder, like, huh? Seriously, that's all you're going to eat? We get up there, and all of a sudden, I had a craving for Mexican food. It's my go-to food. We're going further up towards where uh, Jono had set up some antennas, and we get to the very top of the hill. And I did not know that these people were up there, but some friends of mine from the Watsonville Hispanic Church were, standing, were sitting right under two trees having a meal. I did not know that while we were coming up, one of my friends was preparing a Tupperware of tamales for me. And they were going to bring it down. I said, Lord must be listening to my thoughts because this is what I wanted. How beautiful is it to crave something, to understand how much it, how, how good it tastes. To take that food and and share it with my brother who just pulled up. But it was just amazing how that whole time, hungering, that thing was on my mind. Man, I am hungry. I could really go for this. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the Word today. John chapter 6. And we're going to be going through it. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of parts. We're going to be reading together on a few other parts. But I want you to turn to John chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible with you, pull out your phones. I'm sure you have a, a Bible on your phone. If you don't have that, sit next to somebody that has a Bible. If you have your Bible with you, go ahead and raise it up. Amen. You see, a, a, a soldier who goes into battle without his rifle is dead meat. In the same way, a Christian who does not have their sword with them is easy prey for the devil. And the last person that you should trust is the person that's standing up here, giving the word. So it's important for you that you have your Bible so that you can follow along and keep this person accountable for the things that they're sharing. Amen. That's why it's important to have the Bible. Then on top of that, take these home with you and continue to feed on the things that are today. So if you have your Bible, we are in John chapter 6. We're going to start in verse, we're going to start in verse 22. So we're just going to go over the story very quickly. Uh, Jesus and his disciples had just finished hiking up a mountain. How many of you like to hike? You know, I was so surprised that um, when I would come and visit, last year I, I visited the, the Central Valley pretty often. And uh, I, I was teaching at a school in Antioch called Hilltop Christian School. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But my students would always ask me, Coach, where are you going? I was like, I'm going to Fresno. There's nothing there. I'm like, what? <laughs> so you guys need to get off the internet. It's like, there's nothing in Fresno. I can keep going to Fresno. And so finally, they Instagram. These little kids were stalking me. And they're like, oh, they got mountains in Fresno? It just looks like cows and hay. <laughs> like, wow. You kids, you know, one of these days when your principal, who was my cousin, when your principal allows me to, I'm going to take you guys down to Fresno to show you the real Fresno, the real Central Valley. Anyway, Jesus had just finished hiking up a mountain. He's with his disciples. As they were sitting there, they noticed a multitude of people. We're just going through the story that you know from, it's very familiar to you. 
he notices a multitude of people coming up, and he asks his disciples, where are you going to get the money to buy food? Something. Jesus notices uh, that there is a need. Amen? Are, are we, are we, we could drag the sermon on for longer than two hours. By the way, amen just means that you acknowledge that what I just said. You don't have to agree, just acknowledge it. Jesus sees that there's a multitude of people coming up, and he asks his disciples, where are you going to find the money to buy the food for them? Because he sees they're obviously hungry. If you've ever hiked up a mountain, you will know that you need to take food. I don't care how strong you think you are, you need to, you need to gather up your energy and take that food with you. He notices these people may be short of that, and so he asks his disciples, where are we going to find the money to feed these people? The disciples don't see that need, and Jesus teaches us a very important lesson here, and now I'm going to try and put this together here. Okay. There it is. Book, Ministry of Healing, page 143. It says, Christ's method alone is true success. Savior mingled as one who desired their good, he showed sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. You will see as you look through the Gospels that there's only a handful of times that you see Jesus preaching. Most of the time, what is he doing? He's healing people. He's meeting the needs of the people. Are you with me? Jesus doesn't take... It could be said that, yes... Um, his great that Jesus could serve better than anyone. But I think what made the most impact on the lives of the people that knew who Jesus was was he ministered to their needs. So Jesus sees that these people need food, and what happens? The, di the disciples say they don't have anything. All we have here is a young boy whose lunch has two pieces of fish, and five loaves of bread. And so what does Jesus do? You know, the he takes the five loaves, takes the two fish, and what does he do? He blesses them, and what happens to it? They multiply. Jesus is able to feed the multitude of how many people? 5,000. I was just about to get to that, sister. Thank you so much. 5,000 courted men plus women children. Jesus was able to feed all of them. And then on top of that, what happened with the rest of the food? There was, there was leftovers. How many baskets of leftovers were there? Twelve baskets of leftover food from five loaves of bread and two fish. Five plus two is seven. God gave them the perfect amount. I'm just saying. After this, Jesus performs a miracle. He meets the needs of the people. Then what does he do? He retreats to the mountain. Jesus is teaching us here also that as important as it is to meet the needs of the people, as important as it is to, to, to work amongst the people, you got to take a break. You got to rest. You have to take a vacation because we cannot give to people what we ourselves do not have. Did you catch that? You cannot burn yourself out trying to help someone out. Because then what use are we to them? So Jesus performs this miracle. That the multitude is following him. What does he do? He retreats to the mountains. Him and his disciples go up. They wait for the evening. The disciples come back down. Hop into the boat. I'm just running through the story. We're still in chapter 6. They hop into their boat to go to the other side. Jesus doesn't join them until much later. He walks on water, does his walk on water thing. Hops into the boat, joins them, and then docks on the other side with his disciples. Now, this is where we continue the story. When he gets to the other side, we're going to go down to verse 22 now. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that no boat had come there, except the one that which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat, excuse me, with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. Verse 23 However, Tiberius, near the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. 
Verse 25, and when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? So what do we let's just go through this? What's going on right now? Jesus said, at the 5,000, he now, him and his disciples have retreated to the mountains, came back, took a boat to the other side to retreat again. So try, try to get some rest. But to do that, people are waiting for him on the other side. There are people seeking Jesus. They've have, they have experienced something with Jesus, and they are seeking him out. Okay, excited. Uh, so anyway, keep going. People are seeking out Jesus. There are people who are willing to take their boats to the other side to follow him, and there are others on the other side waiting for him to get there. People are Jesus. So when they finally get there and they see Jesus, oh, Lord, when did you, when did you get here? And Jesus calls them out straight up. You, you didn't come here because you saw the signs of who I was. You came here because you experienced a miracle, and from that miracle, able to eat and you were filled to the full. Then Jesus in verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to life, which the son of man will give you because God the father has set his seal on him. So Jesus says, don't don't look for the food that's going to pass away. Don't look for the food that is going to get spoiled. Look for this food. Then, he, then they ask in verse 28, they say to him, what shall we do that, me, that we may work the works of God? And Jesus, leading their thoughts to, more, to, to a more spiritual lesson, says and answers to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Who is Jesus talking about? He's talking about himself. Him he sent. Therefore, in verse 30, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe in you? What work will you do? Verse 30 tells us very clearly that people are not stupid. But sometimes we act stupid. It's very clear that they know that he's the Messiah. And yet, even after witnessing the miracle of feeding 5,000, plus women and children, feeding 5,000 people, they still want to see a miracle. How many times has God answered your prayer and you still wonder if he's listening? How many times have you begged and pled with God, please, this, 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 and this? He finally answers that prayer and you still wonder if he's listening. What sign? And then it's almost like they were trying to push Jesus in the corner. Continue reading with me in verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread, he meaning uh, Moses, gave them bread from heaven. And I just want to say, I'm so happy that Jesus is Jesus, and I'm not Jesus. Because had that been me, I would have had half of mine to abuse my power. Didn't, you know, so hold up, you just saw me feed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish, and you know I'm the Messiah. And now you want some more? You want me to perform another miracle? How about this? How about I, lay, I make it rain on you for seven years? Just by How about I just put a cloud right over you? Or how about I open up the cloud so that the sun just shines on you? Aren't you happy that Jesus is Jesus and not one of us? Amen? Because when I'm reading this, I'm like, I cannot believe these people are giving Jesus this lip. They just saw something that is impossible. And they still want a sign. Then they go further to say, well, the Bible says, oh, now you want to quote scripture. So now you're quoting scripture incorrectly. Because when they said he will give them bread to eat, they were referring to Moses. And Jesus, his love and kindness and understanding answers them in verse 32. Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven, still leading their thoughts. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then what do the people say? For give us this bread always. And then what? 
Jesus finally brings it across full circle. And Jesus says to them in verse 35, I am the bread of life. You see how he led their thoughts from verse 27 up until now? I want you to know that Jesus acknowledges your intellect. Jesus acknowledges your intellect. Sell your shelter. Wants to giving you the mind to be able to do that. Amen? You are intellectual beings. You are made in the image of God, which means you have the same thought process. You can still use your brain. But Jesus still continues to lead them. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never thirst. They said, Lord, give us this bread. Give us this food always. Stay with me in this same chapter, excuse me, same book. We're going to go back a couple of chapters into chapter 5. Go through another very familiar story. I trust me, it's all connected. It's a bit scatterbrained. I need to have notes. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, I, conversations with me are always interesting. In chapter 4, just before the, the, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus and his disciples are leaving, and they have to through, or they're leaving Judea, Galilee, but in order for them to do, but in order for them to do this, they have to pass through Samaria. Now, Bible scholars, what was wrong with Samaria? Why is this something that the Bible is emphasizing here? Why did they have to mention going to, through Samaria? Bad country. Why is it a bad country? They weren't following. Okay, that's part of it. Thank you. Jesus is a Jew. They are Gentiles, Samarians, Samar Samaritans, one of the people from Samaria. They were a mix of Jew and Gentile. So they were shunned by both sides. So for a Jew to go through Samaria was just, you know, it's just like, hey, you stay on your side of the road, stay on. As they're going through Samaria, they come to a small city called Sychar. And as they're there, Jesus is weary from his trials. They find the, uh, the, the well of Jacob there. He finds rest there, and the disciples go to run their errands. As he goes, as they go to run their errands, there is a woman that comes to the well. We know the story is pretty familiar. The woman comes to the well, and Jesus greets her how? Give me a drink. And, and basically says, you know, men like you don't talk to women like me. And what does Jesus say? We're in chapter 4. We're in chapter 4. Are you with me? We're in and answers to her and said to her in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, I have given you living water. The woman, verse 11, said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. Almost like she's trying to, you know, she's, She's curious. She's asking questions, but almost, you know, it's kind of she's also giving the Lord lip. You got nothing to draw something, anything with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, verse 13, and said to her, whoever drinks of this water, referring to Jacob's well, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. You say, give me this water. When he's on the mountains telling them about bread, what did they say? Give me this bread always. Food, bread, water. Why are we talking about all of this right before we're about to go to potluck? If you're like most people on Saturday mornings, you were probably rushing, trying to get here on time. You skip breakfast. So right about now, your stomach is starting to turn a little bit. Like, this guy needs to hurry up this sermon because I'm trying to get in first in line at this potluck. 
Right about now, you're starting to feel a little bit of the hunger pains. You start biting your nails, hoping that it take it, you know, take away some of that, uh, you know, to take your thoughts away from wanting to eat. Why are we talking about food? Why is this message focused around themes that have to do with food and eating? Let me ask you this. What is the purpose of water? To cleanse, to quench, to replenish, to renew. What is the purpose of food? What's the purpose of bread? To nurture, to nourish, for nutrition and for energy. So, talking about food, talking about water, talking about all of this, why are we bringing the this morning in our message? There's a whole bunch of different reasons, but I want to share with you three this morning. Reason number one, reason number one, the world is hungry for Jesus. I don't think the world is hungry for Jesus. Amen. Don't just say amen because I'm, try, I'm trying to get an amen out of you. I'm not trying to get amen. I'm wanting you to understand what this is. Talk. The world is hungry for Jesus. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus gives Christians a very sacred responsibility found in Matthew chapter 28. Read it with me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father. Oh, hold on. I know there's more than two people in this church. Let's read this again. Matthew 28. Because we all need to recognize what our responsibility is. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go and make some nations. All nations, baptizing them. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Brothers and sisters, the world is hungry for Jesus. And as John O mentioned earlier, right now, people need us more than ever. If you haven't been paying attention, I I took a break from social media this week, and let me tell you something. I was like, wow, this, this is awesome. I don't know what's going on in people's lives. They don't know what's going on in mine. This is amazing. If they really wanted to connect with me, they know how to find me. But if you've been paying attention to what's been going on in the world, in just a matter of weeks, we've experienced earthquakes. We've experienced thunderstorms. We've experienced shootings. And now, knocking on our door, we've experienced fires in a place very close to where I'm originally from, where I live in Northern California. A few of my students that attend Rio Lindo Academy, they know And so they called me up. Thank you so much. Coach, we're fine. I'm like, what do you mean? Oh, you haven't heard? I'm like, heard what? Heard, heard what? Oh, this, this, and this. What? You're telling me the whole academy burned down? Yeah, we're fine. They fires haven't touched us. But if you have not seen what's been going on in the world, now, more than ever, people need to see Jesus. The world is hungry for Jesus. But here's reason number two. Uncle Joe, where should I point this? Right here. We are not hungry for Jesus. Uh, and some people that might come across a little, a little straight, a, a little too uh, harsh. But the reason we are not hungry for Jesus is because we are not desperate enough for Jesus. We are not hungry for Jesus because we are not desperate enough for him. Right now, although we are experiencing the pain that's, that's being experienced around the world from the earthquakes, the storms, the shootings right next door to us, and now even closer to us, the fires in Santa Rosa, Central Valley is fine. Why is it that it's only until something major has happened to us that we finally realize, I should have. I could have. Are you with me? The world is hungry for Jesus, 
but we aren't hungry for Jesus because we are not desperate enough for Jesus. And that, my friends, is something that is, is powerful and at the same time, just, it just kind of puts me, I, I'm, I'm in awe of that. That we have what we have, and yet there is no sense of urgency in our churches. There's no sense of urgency amongst us to want to do more, to be more, to bring these messages to the people who need Jesus. I have a friend who I, I'm, every time this friend of mine invites me to, to, to come to either for a, after Sabbath or just because they, they felt like cooking, I always get excited. I get invited to a lot of places to go and eat, but this one particular uh, friend of mine, their house, I, I, just, I, I just know when I'm going to go there, I'm going to receive a blessing. Hey, uh, you know, my mom is cooking. That's all you have to say. My mom is cooking, so, you know, we're going to have some friends over. We want to invite you. Where are you going after Sabbath? Please come and, come and eat with us. Why do I get excited? First of all, it is Latin food. <laughs> Second of all, I know that this food is going to be cooked with fresh ingredients. It is going to be bursting with flavor. I know that it's being made with love. I've had the opportunity of watching my friend's mother cook. And it's like she has this laser focus. She knows where everything is. She knows how everything needs to be done. She is just moving in that kitchen as though it were something she's been doing all her life. I know this food is made with love. And at the end, I know that when I'm eating and enjoying conversation with the people around me on that table, I will leave fulfilled. And it's amazing when I get there, you know, hey, how you doing? Move out the way. I'll hug you later. Let me go and see where your mama is. Because I want, when are we going to eat? This kind of food is, when I'm looking at it, it looks nice, and, you know, I, I don't want to eat it because it looks that nice. For the younger people, you know, we take pictures of it because for whatever reason, it helps feed other people who are looking at these pictures. So we put these on, on Instagram, and we put them on all the d different social media avenues so people can see what we're eating. And I look at this food, and I don't want to eat it, but at the same time, I'm ready to eat this food. It's amazing when I go there, and sure enough, Fresh ingredients, bursting with flavor. Third, it's made in love. Okay, okay, come on, come on, come on, let's sit down, let's eat. Hurry up, pray, say a prayer so that everyone can eat. And at the very end, even in the middle of eating, are you sure you don't want more? I'm like, hold up, man, let me finish my first plate. Are you sure you don't want more? Because we have more. Go and get more if you're still hungry. And after that, I am fulfilled from the meal that I just received. I love going over to this person's house whenever their mom cooks. I want to present to you, I want to submit to you, brothers and sisters, that Jesus is offering us a home-cooked meal of the bread made from him, cooked or baked with the oil of the Holy Spirit. He's offering us a drink from the, 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 the springs of living water. He's giving us this home-cooked meal. Hear me now. He is giving us himself, but because throughout the week when we come to have this meal in church, when we come for this Sabbath or this spiritual Sabbath potluck, our appetite is so numb because we've been filling ourselves with junk food throughout the week. I'm talking to somebody. We have been filling ourselves with junk food through the week. Not spending time with Christ having these meals that you're supposed to be having with him every night. Last night I had the opportunity. I was invited to a family's house out in Fresno. They said, hey, uh, we heard that you cook some mean burgers. I was like, yeah. It's like, uh, I said, but uh, it, there, there, there are no meat in them. Okay, we'll get the ingredients. So they bought the ingredients. I cooked for the whole family. They did not believe it was not meat. I said, you're welcome. And at the end of it, we had a worship thought. Um, they pulled out a piano that they had not played in years. They said, hey, can you play a song for us? This is the type of meal that we need to have. Fellowship with God. Fellowship with, with our family. Having a home-cooked meal. Brothers and sisters, this meal 
is the same meal that the world is hungering for, but we cannot give it to them because we don't know how to cook it. We're not eating that meal. And so when it comes time for them to ask us for that food, we don't know how to give it to them because we are not desperate enough to learn how to cook that meal. We are not desperate enough to have fellowship with Jesus. I'm okay. I don't need to read my Bible today. I said a short five-minute prayer. I'll be all right. As though that was going to be it for the rest of the week. I know I'm talking to somebody. Jesus wants to, he is giving us this meal. And I want to submit to you once again, church family, that maybe the reason why sometimes, yes, exhaustion has a huge part to play in it. But maybe the reason why sometimes we're falling asleep in church is that the, the meal that God is giving to us is bland. Because our taste buds for spiritual things are so numbed from the, the junk food we've been eating all week. So by the time you get here and your Sabbath school teacher is trying to teach you or, or the preacher is trying to give something to you to fill your hearts and your minds, you're falling asleep because that meal just doesn't taste good. And it doesn't taste good because you haven't been eating it all week. How can we give to the world what we ourselves don't have? Why are we not desperate for Jesus? That always is, it just boggles my mind. We need to be desperate for Jesus like a mother searching for her child who was just standing next to her. Where is my son? What do you, those of you who have kids, you know they run around. They have their, their moments. There was a time my mom said she lost me in for about six hours. I didn't, I wasn't old enough to know. <laughs> she just said, Vasa, stay right there. Uh, look, you take your kids, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to do that stuff because I'm not a dad yet. But she said, Vasa, stay right there. Now, I was about this short, um, that small. And I started to, I, from what I remember from that whole incident, was, was playing around running through the, you know, running through the clothes. Like, yeah. Pretty soon, I couldn't see my mom anymore. And I was fine. I did not know that six hours had passed, and when my mom finally found me, she picked me up as if she had never seen me before. We need to be desperate in that same way, searching for a lost child. We need to be desperate for Jesus like a child who has been ridden with cancer, waiting for the relief of some type of medicine that might give him hope for a new life. We need to be desperate for Jesus like a man who is engulfed in flames, searching for water. We need to be desperate for Jesus like the deer that panteth for the water. We need to be desperate for Jesus like the woman who was sick with a blood illness and found no relief in the prescriptions of the doctors of the world and said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. We need to be desperate for Jesus. Like a man who has been waiting at the pool of Bethesda, who tried each year to make it in there when it was time for healing, but nobody would help him. We need to be desperate for Jesus, like a paralytic whose friends would not take a crowded house as an excuse not to bring him to Jesus. So what did they do? They took him to the ceiling, took him to the roof, tore that piece off, and laid him at the feet of Jesus. We need to be desperate for Jesus in that same way. And the reason... And I'm so passionate about today's message because two years ago, <laughs> I had been stuffing myself beyond what I should have been able to take of the junk food of despair and doubt. I had been feeding myself with the lies that the devil was giving me that I was not enough. I kept dipping my hand back into the bag of cherished sins because I was not spending the time I needed with Jesus. And any time someone offered me a meal from his word, it wasn't good enough for me. We're not desperate for Jesus because Jesus is no longer enough. I was in need of the word of God. But man, that junk food had me chained. And it got to the point where I was so junk food wasted that I had successfully convinced myself that I was no longer any use to this world. And I made the foolish decision to take my own life. I praise God that that next day when I planned on ending my life, Jesus held me close so I wouldn't let go. 
through the actions of people in my life who had been filled to the full with Jesus, who had had meals every single night with Jesus. They reached out to me. These Christians, these followers of Christ who had an experience with Jesus came to my aid. And as Jesus led those people's thoughts in the mountains, they led my thoughts back to Jesus. Bitterly, I didn't cry. There's a difference. Gangsters don't cry. I wept. Begging Christ for a new beginning and asking him what I needed to have in my life. I finally gave him the baggage that I had been foolishly holding on to, thinking that I would be able to manage it. And I fell at his feet and said, Lord, I am tired of running. I am tired of trying to do what was obviously your job. Please save me. And almost immediately after I prayed that prayer, I received a text message from my cousin who had just received a position as a principal at a school in Antioch called Hilltop Christian School is the administrator, he's, he's, like I said, he's the principal, but he, he wore many hats. On top of being the administrator, the principal, he was marketing, he was sales, he was, he was you. He was doing all those different things, and on top of that, he was a seventh and eighth grade teacher, he was also the athletic director. We get these, you know, our teachers take on so much, and by the way, if you get a chance, thank those people that volunteer. Thank those teachers, because you have no idea how much they wear, and that hat is heavy. He, was, he had all these different responsibilities, and he texted me and said, hey, when you get a chance, give me a call. I knew exactly what was going to happen because I had worked for him at another Christian school as his art teacher, and he eventually sucked me in to being an athletic director and coaching, and for the next six years, <laughs> I was teaching the second half of his class. So now that he's the principal, I knew exactly what was going to happen. Here's the difference. When he called me in the first time, I made up every excuse. I, hey, man, I don't have a teaching degree. I don't, what do you want me to teach? I just need you to come in and teach the kids what you know. I'm like, I don't know a lot. He said, put on, put on YouTube. I don't know. Speedy, I could do that. He's like, no, 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 no. Teach him how to do the other stuff that you do. I paint him and draw him. He says, yeah, just come in. I can't pay you, but I'll give you free lunch. I'm like, how dare you? I'll be there. <laughs> well, what time? Okay, I'll be there. For the next six years, I would work for him as his art teacher, as his PE teacher. And now he's this principal. I knew exactly what was coming. He said, when I called him, hey, what's up? Nothing. Not knowing what I had just gone through. You know, guys, what's up? None. Jim. Uh, by the way, parents, when guys usually say that, the nothing, chilling, whatever, that usually engulfs a whole wide array of different sentences that they actually want to say, but they're just basically saying nothing. As we're talking, he said, hey, look, I'm just going to be straight up with you. I need your help. He didn't really need my help. He's done these things many times before. He didn't really need my help. But maybe something or someone had told him that I needed help. And so he dragged me up to one of the places I asked God never to take me, the East Bay. Now, the reason why I don't like the East Bay, East Bay, if you know anything about the Bay Area or, or Northern California, this is where Oakland is. This is where Richmond is. This is where Hayward is. This is some of the most violent areas in Northern California or in California altogether. I mean, just the fact that I said, oh, some of y'all. Yes. And I ended up being a teacher, teaching art for seventh and eighth grade. I became his athletic director for fifth through eighth grade. I did his Bible studies for his students from fifth to eighth grade. And I ended up coaching all the sports, even sports that I didn't even coach. And that's why I chose this picture. I have not, I don't know how to play soccer. <laughs> the closest thing I got to soccer was the little, uh, what's that table game that you play? Foosball? <laughs> I can't play soccer. All, this, all the sports I knew how to play involved using your hands and the ball. You, you telling me to use my feet? What am I supposed to teach these kids? And this is my cousin's fam- famous answer. I, and I know when he says this, it's going to be all right. He said, oh, we'll see what's up. That doesn't give me any, any relief, man. I taught all of them these different things while talking to friends, asking them for tips. Like, hey, how do I warm up kids for soccer? Hey, what are some drills I need to do for soccer? 
And what I didn't know is, even though I didn't have or I don't have a teaching degree, even though I don't have any experience in being an athletic director officially, I wondered, why did God send me up there? You see, after I had made the decision to take my life and Jesus saved me from that, he had to teach me how to eat again. Jesus had to teach me how to cook again. Jesus had to teach me how to make the right decisions again. He took me out of my comfort zone, which is music, which is art, and put me into something that I was totally not ready for. Now, I had some experience with it, but now I was leading the whole thing. I had no idea what was going to happen. But while I was doing that, as I was learning how to eat again, as I was learning what to eat again, I did not know that more than 67% of the kids that attended this school, more than half of the kids in this picture here were non-Christian and non-Adventist. As they saw me making changes in my life, they got curious. Coach, what are you doing? Why are you so tired when you come to work? I was up at 4. Why are you up at 4? Why do old people get up so early? He's like, you watch your mouth. You're going to work on some suicides all day today. He's like, why? No, seriously. You up? I'm like, cause I went to the gym. I was working out. Really? They start to see changes. There was a couple of times where they would see me eating nothing but a salad, not because I was trying to make a point. It was just I only had salad. Coach, um, why are you eating salad? Cause I like plants. I don't know. Why are you asking me these questions? D- does it taste good? Yeah. Can I have some? What happened to your lunch? My, my, my parents didn't feed me. I was like, your parents didn't, you ain't got hands? Go fix your own lunch. Next time, come tomorrow, bring a lunch. Okay, but can I have some of your salad? Eventually, I saw my students coming to food, uh, coming to school with vegetarian food. I said, Coach, hey, what's this Morning Star stuff? I'm like, oh, that's uh, uh, it's fake meat. But why are you eating that? Where are you? Oh, we saw it because we saw you eating it the other day. I was like, I wasn't. That stuff is not good for you. And then eventually I saw them going from eating Doritos every day. Or no, they love Takis. Man, those things are crazy. They went from eating that, and I would see them snacking on carrots. I'm like, what are y'all doing? Oh, we just felt, you know, because basketball is here. And, you know, you were telling us that we need to stay away from the junk food, so we're eating carrots. I'm like, they have any sauce on them? You have any special seasoning on them is why you're eating them so much? Nah, we just want to do it because... We saw you doing something like this. We cannot give to others what we do not have ourselves. When the world is hungry, we have to be ready to feed them. But we can't feed them if we have not had that food for ourselves. This is my team here, or one of my teams, the Hilltop Christian School. Oh, they were so proud because we were the only school that had orange as a color. Every other school, blue, white, black, red. The only other people that would see with with different colors is Fresno, if we would see them at elementary uh, tournaments. Hey, those guys have gold. Yeah. (sighs) We got orange. But they were so proud, and they were happy. And every Friday, even when I told them weeks before, I'm not going to be here for Bible study. Coach, are we going to have Bible study? Didn't I just tell you I'm not going to be here for Bible study? So can we, like, FaceTime you? I'm not going to. They were hungry for Jesus. Think about the people in your circle of influence. When they look at you, when they experience you, do they thirst for Jesus around you? When they look at you and experience you, are they hungry for an understanding of the Jesus that you know? One of the reasons I agreed to help uh, Jono this year in, in football is because he said something to me that was very important. He said, we believe in everything. And and to many people, that's very cliche, but I believed it when it came from him because I told him, I I would tell him, if you're all about winning, I can't help you. He said, I want to help to mentor these boys. I was like, okay, we're there. So whatever he said, if if I was able to make it, I would do it. And it was a big thing for me because Mountain View Academy, where I, I graduated from, and Fresno Academy are rivals. And my brothers, my two younger brothers, coach on Mountain View side, 
the day that they saw me wearing a Fresno sweatshirt, they didn't say anything. All they did was. <laughs> that, that, that rivalry runs thick. It's, it's crazy. Anyway, we cannot give to people what we do not have. In the book, Lift Him Up, page 265, and we're almost done, it says, Enoch walked with God. But how did he gain this sweet intimacy? He walked with God. How did he gain this sweet intimacy? It was by having thoughts of God continually before him. So then the question is, how? How can we begin to build or renew this relationship with God? How can we have our thoughts continually before him? Let's see if this uh, goes to the next. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is not the slide I wanted, but it's okay. There it is. So this is a group that I sing with. This was taken back in 2013. Now, you can't see it, but if you look at my hand, I have it right over my suit because I could not fit into that suit. So to look nice for the picture, I had to, you know, tuck in the gut and make sure that it was nice and fit. In this picture, Reached my, I had reached my at 343 pounds. And I was only a few pounds away from being 350. When I went to the doctors, they asked me at the time, how old are you? I, I couldn't find the other picture, but this is just a, a, a picture closest to it. But at that time, it, I was 28 years old, almost 350 pounds. And when the doctor asked me that question, my heart just sank. He said, how, how old are you? 28. 28, starts looking through, you know, the papers that, my blood pressure and everything. He's like, if you don't change something, you're going to have to live on pills for the rest of your life. If you don't change something, you're going to have to be injecting yourself with some type of insulin for the rest of your life. Is that what you want? For whatever reason, it never bothered me before because, once again, I had allowed myself to eat the junk food that it's okay for Samoan people to be big. Now, naturally, we are bigger than everybody else. Yes, we are farmers, we're warriors. So our frames are always going to be bigger than everyone else. But to be to the size where we could barely move, in 2008, from this chair up here, I could not move from that chair to be up here without breaking a full-on sweat. It was that bad. And it's hard for me to share that because I'm, I'm, I'm a little self-conscious about it. But I'm sharing this with you to make a point. In order for us to hunger for Jesus, the first thing that we need to do is recognize your need for a Savior. People are going to tell you every single day, hey, man, you need to do this. Hey, you need to do this. You need to do this. It isn't until you recognize it for yourself to make a change that a change can happen. That's the first thing you need to do. The second thing that you need to do is to make that change. Make those conscious health decisions or make those conscious decisions to change your health for the better. In 2013, I was cornered at an Army Bible camp. I don't know if you're familiar with Army Bible camp. It's a, you, you familiar with it? Right on, sister. Where uh, for four days, people from everywhere, from all faith backgrounds, uh, uh, it's, it's run by uh, Pastor Myers, come together and learn how to study the Bible. And so our team here was the team that led out in the music. And they had been telling me, you need to go to the health program. I'm like, Why are, you guys, are you guys calling me fat in my face? Like, this is so not cool. You need to go to the health program. You need to go up to Weimar. Anybody familiar with Weimar? You need to go to Weimar. I'm like, I'm not going to Weimar. There's nothing these skinny people can tell me about how to be healthy. It, it just didn't make any sense to me. But I had to make the conscious decision to make these changes in my life, because I don't know about you, I like food. I'm not a big fan of pills. I'd like to take the burger as it is and not in a small form of a, a chalky white thing. I don't know about you, but I like smoothies. And I would rather drink them through my mouth than through my stomach or through anywhere else. I had to make these changes. And so the, to answer your question, how then can we rebuild? How then can we begin to <clears throat> build this relationship with God? 
And I want to suggest to you, and first of all, let me go to this. Oh, there we go. That you need a new start. Anybody familiar with this acronym? Now, yes, I ended up going to Weimar. <laughs> it's another story for another time. But when I went up there, this acronym was, was like air to everybody. Everybody knew what this acronym was and what it means. And today I want to submit to you that this is what we need in our spiritual lives to rededicate ourselves and to be hungry for Jesus again. The N stands for nutrition. In John chapter 6, verse 36, we're not going to go 6, verse 35 and 36. If you want to, I would suggest you write these down or take a mental picture of them because I want you to study these for yourself. Nutrition. Jesus says in the book of John chapter 6, verse 35 and 36, I am the bread of life. If you eat from me, you will not go hungry, you will not thirst. So the first one is nutrition. Second thing. Exercise. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 tells us that faith without works is dead. You've got to exercise what you've been learning in church. You've got to exercise what you've been learning in your personal studies because then it makes sense. When faith without works is dead. Third one, water. John chapter 7, verse 37, Jesus says, Those who thirst come to me and drink and thirst no more. Next one. Uh, the back. Can we go back one, please? Oh, did I miss the S? All right. No worries. S stands for sunlight. John chapter 9, verse 5. I am the light of the world. We need to follow the light. That even in the darkness, we'll have something that we can follow, that we can depend on. Uh, the next one, T, temperance. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, reminds us that we are running a race. And when you're training, when you're running for a race, you need to be temperate of all things. Very simply meaning, get away from the bad stuff, keep the good stuff. Number, or excuse me, A, air. Chapter 33, verse 4, Job says, the spirit of the Lord made me and his breath brought life into me. Breathe in Jesus, everybody. Breathe in that, that, uh, that, that, that life. Number, uh, next one. Are rest. Are you happy that it's the Sabbath? Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, that if you have not yet found it, come unto me, all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then finally, T, trust in God. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. I want to submit to you this morning that you, what we need is to make a decision for a new start so that God can begin to mold in us a new heart. I want to end with this, that the world is hungry. They are craving for something different than what has been offered to them, and some may know what it is while others don't. The world is desperate for a change, and they want something new. They want something fulfilling. The world wants something everlasting. I believe that God's people have what the world has been looking for, but once again, we cannot give to others what we ourselves do not have. In order for us to feed a desperate world, we need to be first desperate for Jesus so that when we finally meet, excuse me, when we finally come to meet the needs of those people, we can mingle with them and let them know, hey, I know you. I know you've been searching. And I know you're yearning for something different. You're looking for something more. Let me introduce you to my friend Jesus. This week, I want to challenge you. Clear out your spiritual cupboards of all the spiritual junk food that is hindering you from experiencing the wonderful meal of life. Inside every task and idol that is stopping you from building a relationship with Jesus, search for him each day. And if you need help looking for Jesus, you are surrounded by others who are earnestly searching for Jesus. Prayer each day to ask God to draw you nearer to him.